Hello friends, and welcome back to another video in a series in which we walk the road less traveled in matters of biblical discourse and inquiry, and hopefully along the way discover some interesting things about the good book that most people will never get to hear. One of the reasons why I'm doing these videos is because I enjoy the engagement that I see in people when they encounter a story in the Bible as if for the first time. Even if they've heard the story before, Oftentimes, especially for us folks who grew up in the church or grew up exposed to these stories, they become commonplace to us. We accept some pious and rather shallow interpretation of them, and they become background noise. And we don't really understand or see either the historical context or the message that the writer was trying to convey to us. So this story is one such that I would encourage you to put your thinking caps on and engage your minds. And it's probably familiar to you if you've grown up in church. This story is called Revenge of the Virgins, The Assassination of Lot. And it is a chapter two of the Sodom and Gomorrah story. And if you haven't had a chance to see that, then I encourage you to go back and watch the last video in which we gave the background for all that is about to come. Now, before we jump into the main act of our story, I want to think about Lot for a minute. He's a really interesting character. There isn't a lot written about him, but what there is, is quite colorful and revealing. Here's some things we know about Lot. First of all, as you already know, he's an extraordinarily gracious host. To a fault, actually. He's even willing to forgo the well-being of his women folk in order to pursue such an enterprise. Lot also has a fondness for the grape. He has a propensity for prodigious consumption of alcohol, as we may call the failing. It's about to get him into big trouble, as you're about to see. I also want to plant a flag here and point out that Lot, despite what you may think of him from the last story, and what you will probably think of him from this story, he is considered a hero of faith, an exemplar of righteousness by some New Testament authors. And I'm going to give you a perspective from one of those writers, one of those authors, and... I'm going to read you a passage found in 2 Peter. It is chapter 2, starting with verse 4, and it reads as follows, quote, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them into gloomy dungeons to be held for judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others, if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ash and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued Lot, a righteous man, who was distressed by the filthy lives of the lawless men, for that righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard, if this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue godly men from trials and to hold the unrighteous for the day of judgment. End quote. Well, I want you to tuck that in the back of your mind and see how that fits with your psyche by the time we complete this story. All right, so let's get started. You'll remember that Lot fled to Zoar, but there's been some interesting developments in the passages between Genesis chapter 19, verse 25, and Genesis chapter 19, verse 30. Because Lot leaves Zoar, apparently pretty quickly, and we find him in the beginning of our story in the mountains, precisely where the angels told him to go in the first place, living in a cave with his two daughters. Now, the text doesn't tell us why he left Zoar, but scholars and biblical exegetes have certainly speculated. One of my favorite speculations, which seems pretty plausible, is that, well, with the fire and uh, hell at his back, which he wouldn't dare turn to face after what happened to his wife, he felt the Zoar was just a little bit too close to the action after all, and said to his daughters, maybe something to the effect of, the hell with this bullshit, girls, pack up your stuff and get in the general league, we're hell and ass to the mountains, let's go! Another speculation, which I find to be rather pious poppycock, is that when Lot entered the city of Zoar, he found the inhabitants as unrighteous as those of Sodom, 
and decided that it was only a matter of time before God wreaked the same destruction upon Zoar after all, and besides didn't want his girls to be any further exposed to such unrighteousness and wickedness, and therefore took them off to the mountains for purity's sake. Whatever the case, he's in the mountains, alone and isolated, and we don't know how long he was there before his girls, his two daughters, had a conversation. The oldest daughter says something rather strange and creepy to the youngest daughter. She says, You know, our daddy is old, and there ain't no man around here to lie with us, as is the custom of all the earth. You know what we should do? We should make him drink wine and get him drunk, and then I'll go in tonight and have sex with him and get pregnant, and tomorrow you can do the same, and thereby we can preserve the bloodline of our father. Whew. Wow. I can just see the eyes of the younger daughter shifting downward and to the right, and her thinking, well, that's not what I was planning on doing my evening. But the words evidently hit home, and she's convinced because that's exactly what the two of them do. Uh, night number one, the oldest daughter gets dad to, to drink, and I don't know where the wine came from. I suppose it came from Zoar, and Lot had the, the presence of mind to pack before, before going enough wine to get him roaring drunk on at least two nights. And the text says that Lot didn't know when she came in and didn't know when she left. I think that's the text's way of saying that Lot was so damn drunk he didn't know what the hell was going on. Sort of a modern day Rohypnol, right? Date rape drug. Getting Lot off the hook a little bit and making him a little bit less guilty of the whole affair, I suppose. Even so, his faculties were working well enough to get the job done, to do the deed, and get this young woman pregnant. Night number two comes, and now it's the youngest daughter's turn. They get dad drunk again, and maybe they get the youngest daughter a little drunk too. And the text says that Lot doesn't know when she came in, nor did he know when she left, and she is pregnant as well. And through the passing of time, the two women have baby boys. The oldest daughter named her son, and I love this, Moav, which means from my father. The youngest daughter named her son Ben-Ami, which means son of my people. These two boys become nations. Moab becomes the people of Moab, the Moabites. Ben-Ami becomes the Ammonites, who are on-again, off-again enemies and friends of Israel. So, that concludes our story. Well, that didn't take long. But I think we need to analyze the story a bit. Instead of passing off this act as just a, an example of more sodomite depravity, I think there's more to it that the authors wanted us to understand. I hope there's some questions occurring to you by now. First and foremost might be, what the hell were these two girls thinking? Who in their right minds would ever justify such an act? So, point number one, it seems pretty clear that these poor girls thought they were the last people on earth. Apparently, God's destruction was so dramatic and so decisive, and like Noah and his family, they were the last people on earth. Well, that's a starting point, but it's not enough to explain why these girls would have decided such. Can you imagine? I mean, can you imagine any woman in her right mind, regardless of the circumstances and the survival of the human race? Now, I don't know if these two girls knew the story of Adam and Eve, but I'd have said, God, you made man from the dust of the earth and made woman from one of his ribs. You can do the same dang thing to hell with the human race because I am not going to my father. So... I think the point we need to consider here is the difference in culture and society economically, socially, culturally, and so on. First of all, women did not have the rights that obviously they do today. Women were the chattel of their fathers until they became the chattel of their husbands and were utterly dependent upon them financially. Furthermore, there was no welfare system by which women could be taken care of in their old age. Literally, their retirement was their sons. They were traditionally taken care of and cared for by their sons. They were very likely to outlive their husbands. Certainly, these two girls would outlive Lot. If they didn't have sons, they were screwed. Now, I want to throw something else at you, and that's the concept of the afterlife for the Hebrews. They didn't know anything about a bodily resurrection. 
nor did they know anything about a soul that would waft off the body at death and go be reunited with God in paradise. For them, the human being was nefesh, that is to say flesh, animated by the breath or ruah of God. And for them, the afterlife was Sheol, the grave, where everybody was going and from which no one escaped. For a Hebrew, an ancient Hebrew, say, the only chance you had of an afterlife was your bloodline, your family. Because you were going to die, they were going to go on to carry your name and your seed on down through the generations. That was it. I don't know that the authors of this story would have had us believe that these two girls were thinking about this consciously. It certainly would have formed the culture in which they were raised and in which their psychology was formed. I'll make a final point here. And that's, there's a delicious irony in what these two young women did to their father in light of what he would have allowed them to be subjected to at the hands of a mob of men earlier in the chapter. Now I want to be careful here because I don't want to conflate the experience that Lot suffered at the hands of, or between the legs of, his two daughters and that of a woman being gang raped. To see that horror show played out in all its grisly glory, go to Judges chapter 19 and see what happens to the concubine who's thrown out to a similar mob by her Levite master. It doesn't take much imagination or intelligence to understand how these two scenarios are different. So I'm trying to think the thoughts of the Hebrew writers here, and how, as far as they were concerned, the guilt and ignominy that would have been conferred upon a person subjected to ungodly sex, whether willingly or unwillingly. Now, not even the most conservative and pious modern reader would dare suggest that a woman who had been raped had had in any way her moral or sexual purity compromised, right? But that wasn't true of this culture. But paradoxically, the Hebrew writers were using that fact to grant a little payback or poetic justice to these two young women for what their father had done to them earlier in the chapter. And what he had done was essentially offer them up for rape to a gang of men, to be humiliated and degraded and debased. And for Lot's crime, Lot himself was humiliated, debased, and disgraced by his two daughters. And as gentle and painless as his ordeal might have been, as complicit as he may or may not have been in the affair, the assassination of his character was extensive, and the blot of shame on his good name remains to this day. Now I will leave you with that thought and remind you of the passage in 2 Peter that we just read a few minutes ago and ask you again, how do you feel about that? And does it make you wonder if perhaps the writer of that commentary had in fact read this story? And if he had, maybe he wouldn't have been so sanguine about Lot's righteousness. Well friends, if you've enjoyed this video and if you're hungry for more, Stay tuned for the next episode, because we're going to continue this incestuous subject, and we're going to introduce you to a woman named Tamar, and her libidinous, knuckle-dragging father-in-law, Judah. We'll see another example of how a woman uses her cunning, intelligence, and the tools she has available to her to take a seemingly unwinnable and disastrous circumstance and turn it to her favor. Folks, there is so much more grist for the mill and the good book to contemplate and consider. I hope you'll join me. Lord willing, I'll see you in the next video.